wanted to uh, introduce the last speaker uh, of the of the day. Um, so this is uh, Virginia Gletis is a PhD student at the University of Warwick and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, so you have been following the summer school. She was uh, presenting already um, uh, how uh, you can um, uh, build uh, multi-task caption process models. Um, I think she's going to be talking about, about about that here as well in the context of causality. I really like the title of the talk, uh, Causal Decision Making Meet uh, Gaussian Process, in the context of a workshop that is about causal inference meets probabilistic models. <laughs> so I'm uh, really looking forward to, uh, to see what you're going to be talking about. And uh, I leave you, everyone, with, with Virginia. Thanks, Javier. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying till the end of the workshop. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about causal decision making. And I'm going to do that with Gaussian processes. Um, so I'll, um, let me see if my slide, yes. Yeah. So I'll start with um, a framework that one can use to identify optimal intervention in a graph. And then I'll cover very briefly an extension that we can use to make this framework efficient. So what do I mean by causal decision making? So with causal decision making, I refer to the idea of integrating causal consideration into our choice process. And so take decision on the basis of the causal knowledge. And this is really important because it allows us to take actions, reasoning about what result we expect to get. So for instance, let's, see, let's look at this causal graph, which on the, on the right, which is taken from the book of Y, which is a very good introduction on the topic. Um, and this is one of the causal graphs that has been used in the past to explain or determine the causal effect of smoking on lung cancer. So we wanna use a causal graph like this one, for instance, to assess whether in order to decrease the probability of having lung cancer, we should, um, for instance, uh, decrease or quit smoking. Now, there are a lot of possible uh, systems and processes that can be decomposed in a set of interconnected nodes and can be represented by a causal graph. Now, for instance, this causal graph describes the effect of different variables among which we find salt fumigans, L1 population, and the way they affect crop yield. This other causal graph, which we use in the paper that I will mention later, represents how different environmental variables are affecting the net ecosystem calcification rate. And I should say that uh, the shaded nodes represent nodes or variables that are observed, while the dotted nodes represent variables that we can observe, but we cannot intervene on, so we call them non-manipulative variables. This other graph is, uh, is representing how different risk factors affect the level of process-specific antigen, PSA. And again, we can intervene on the level of statin drugs that we give a patient, and we can intervene on the level of aspirin, uh, but we cannot directly change his age or cancer, the fact of that he has cancer or not, or the BMI level. So again, these are non-manipulative variables. So in all of these examples, we have a causal graph we assume to be able to collect observational data from the, the, the nodes, the variables that we observe, and we can run experiments. Now, we can run experiments in reality, for example, for the crop yield example, or through a simulator that we constructed in the PCA healthcare example. Um, and for each experiment that we run, we have a cost that depends on the number of variables that we intervene on and what kind of intervention we perform. So if we intervene on two variables, we'll, play a higher cost, we'll have a higher cost compared to an intervention on a single variable. Um, so the goal uh, and what we want to look at today is how can we efficiently find the system configuration that optimizes a target node. And what do I mean by that? Well. First of all, in terms of system configuration, I refer to the idea of finding the value of the manipulative variables that we need to set in order to optimize a target node, so a variable of interest within the graph. Um, so for instance, how, what value of soil fumigants should I set in order to optimize the crop yield? Or what value of statin, uh, what uh, quantity of statin drugs should I give a patient in order to minimize the level of PSA? Um, so these are the type of questions that we'll try to answer. And but we would also like to do it in a very efficient way. So we have different type of information. We have different type of data that we have collected over time. And we would like to have a model that integrates all of this information, exploring the system as efficiently as possible, because as we know, each intervention is costly. Um, it's long to, it, it's, uh, you know, it uh, has different costs. It might be slow to perform, and it might also have some ethical issues. 
Right, so for instance, uh, just to state and to clarify what we try to answer, in the case of the crop yield example, we might be interested in learning the expe expected crop yield under different intervention. So this is just like a causal, in, the causal inference question. But we might also be interested in learning what is the optimal thing to do if I want to optimize the crop yield. But also, I might have collected in the past some interventional data. So say in the past, I've already intervened on soil fumigants and I've observed the answer. So how can I exploit this information and integrate this information in order to assess uh, with a specific probability distribution, what is the output that I would get from an alternative intervention? So in order to do that, we need to perform experiments, integrate, again, all of the data intervention and observational data, and transfer interventional distribution. So these are the three things that we will look at today. Um, so before getting deeper into the model, I'd like to just give you a very, very brief um, recap on the things that you need to, to know to understand what I'm going to be talking about. And I saw that you've covered it in different ways today, but it's, it's a very short recap. Um, so we are given a setting where we have a causal graph and we have a four tuple that includes the exogenous variables, the endogenous variable, and functional mappings. So they are linking each node to its parents. So for instance, we have the causal graph on the left. Here, everything is observed. And we have a related structural equation model. And these are assumed, so the causal graph is assumed to be known in this, in this framework. Um, so when we perform an intervention, what we do is we set the value of a variable, capital X, to a specific value. And this, in the first framework, is denoted with the do operator. Um, so on the one hand, we have our observed universe from which we can collect observational data that can be used to estimate our structural equation model and our observational distribution. On the other hand, if we intervene, we break the relationship between a variable and the parents. So we modify the structural equation model, replacing one functional relationship with a constant because we have fixed the value of a variable. And if we observe this post in the intervention universe, we collect what we call interventional data that can be used to estimate the interventional distribution. Now, the important thing is that observation and interventional distributions are different. The interventional one is denoted with the do operator. And generally, this is what we are interested in, in learning because these allow us to determine the effect of an action. So again, there are two different ways to estimate this interventional distribution. We either intervene, we collect interventional data, and this can be used directly to estimate our interventional distribution. Or we observe, we collect observational data, and then we can do some computations that we call that are the, the rules of the calculus to approximate our interventional distribution. So with the do calculus, we compute some integrals, like the one that I've written here. This is a backdoor adjustment in this specific graph structure. And we, we get some approximation that obviously the, the, the accuracy of this approximation will depend on um, how well I'm estimating these conditional distributions. Uh, so when we try to find the optimal intervention in a graph, what we want to solve is a causal optimization problem. And I'll focus on explaining what this means. So basically, we're trying to find the intervention, the intervention set, so which variable I should intervene on, and this is capital XS, such that when I intervene on the variables uh, and I set their value to small XS, I'm maximizing the expected value of the target. So um, this power X um, stands for the power set of the manipulative variables, meaning I want to explore all of the possible intervention that I can perform in a graph. Um, while this D of capital X, uh, it's denoting the interventional domain. So what is the optimal value that I should set of soil fumigants if I can set it between zero and 10? Um, so what we want to find is the optimal intervention set, capital S star, uh, X S star and the intervention uh, level small X S star. So this is different from the, um, um, the global optimization problem. Uh, indeed, when you uh, perform, when you try to solve a global optimization problem, what you do is you try to set to find the intervention level, assuming that you're going to intervene on all of the possible variable. So um, 
what you do is when you do a global optimization problem is you break all of the causal relationship between the inputs. Um, so visually, you can see how on the left, we have this causal graph that we're going to use later for other experiments. And we have some complex relationship with some unobserved confounders, which are, by the way, denoted by these dashed edges. Um, and so I'm trying to find what is the optimal thing to do? Should I intervene on E? Should I intervene on D? Should I intervene on E and D? Or maybe I should do B? Um, and uh, by, when, I, when I try to instead optimize Y in a global optimization framework, I, I try to change all of the inputs that I can change, basically. Um, so one way to solve a global optimization problem, especially when the function is unknown, multimodal, expensive to evaluate, or perturbed by noise, is Bayesian optimization. So what you do in Bayesian optimization, my slides are not working. Um, so what you, what you do in Bayesian optimization is you collect data point and you, cho you choose the data point maximizing an, uh, an acquisition function. And then at the end, you have a bunch of points and you find the optimal uh, among these points uh, with the idea of exploring the space uh, um, to find the optimum as fast as possible. Now, keeping the same idea, when you have a um, target function that is unknown, multimodal, perturbed by noise, and but you also have the knowledge that is encoded in a causal graph, you can develop what we call a causal Bayesian optimization algorithm. So the idea is, again, you run interventions. At this point, you don't only explore the input space, but you explore the input space, which is the value of the variables, but also the intervention sets, which are this capital X, to find the optimal as soon as possible. Same idea. Now, um, slides not work. OK. Um, the first thing that you may notice and that you can you can you can, you can notice is that if you have a big graph, the power the, the number of all the possible interventions that you can perform can be quite large. So exploring this power set can be very computationally intensive. So the first thing to notice is that you don't actually need to explore all of these sets because you can exploit some properties of the causal graph, and you can you, you may realize that. Um, some sets don't, don't need to be explored as they are going to give you the same type of result, the same type of Y, but a higher cost. So let's not get into the details of what these sets are, but bear in mind that the problem, the, the, the complex, computational complexity of the problem can be reduced by exploiting pro properties of the graph. Um, so as we said, one way to solve a causal optimization problem is through causal Bayesian optimization. Causal Bayesian optimization, I'll start describing the algorithm by this example, which I think will clarify what we are trying to do. So let's consider this very, very simple example in which we have these X, Z, and Y variables. Y is the target. Here, X and Z are both observed and they're all both manipulatives. So in this case, I want to decide whether I should intervene on Z or I should intervene on X, or I should intervene on both in order to optimize the target Y. I have a structural equation model, and I can plot, in this case, they are one-dimensional, two-dimensional, the objective functions that I'm trying to optimize. So this first plot here is, gonna, is giving you the true expected value of Y, given that we intervene on X. This, uh, this function here is giving you the expected value of Y, given that we intervene on Z. Well, if we intervene on both, we get this function here, this two-dimensional function. So the first thing to notice is that actually we don't need to intervene on x and z at the same time because this function is invariant on, uh, on the x dimension. So for each value of z, we get the same result for every value of x. So we just need to explore z, which will give us the same result at a lower price, uh, lower cost. So that's what I was referring to when I was saying we might need to reduce uh, we might um, be able to reduce the complexity of the problem. So given this function, what are we trying to do? Well, first of all, uh, we, uh, so in order to, to find the optimal, we're going to place a GP prior on the expected value of Y, given that we do an intervention. So we're going to have different GP for every intervention that we want to explore. And the GP is going to have a specific structure in the sense that the, the, the mean function, the kernel function, will be computed by exploiting the information that is given uh, to us from the observational data. So given the observational data, we can apply the do calculus, get some approximation of these orange quantities here that can be then uh, 
uh, incorporated in the model through the prior construction. So specifically, the mean function of this GP is given by the expected value of y given that we do. So the, the, the computation on our do computation um, and the variance of uh, the kernel structure of this GP is uh, given by the RBF kernel plus um, a term that is inflating the variance depending on the uncertainty that we have um, on the prior mean on the on the do computations. So let's look at an example. And the function that I'm giving you here is one of the function that we are, try we are trying to optimize. So it's this specific one, but the same could be said about the expected value of y given the intervention on z. So in black, we have the true function. Um, in uh, red, um, we have the prior mean uh, constructed in this way with the do calculus. In uh, blue, we have the posterior distribution, so posterior mean and posterior variance. Well, in, in, uh, in these red, dot, red dots represent interventional data and these green crosses represent observational data. So the idea is that by integrating these sources of data, we are able to get an, a predictive, uh, sorry, a posterior uh, mean function, which is very close to the true function, even in areas, for instance, this part where interventional data are not available. And this is because in this data, in this part of the input space, we have observational data that are providing some information through the prior construction. This is uh, um, very good compared to what you would get uh, using a standard GP prior. So this is what, uh, so this in blue in this plot is the posterior distribution that you would get by placing a standard prior on the expected uh, Y given do of X. And you can see how now the, the GP would just move over the three data points that we have observed because we have not integrated the observational information. Now, as in a Bayesian optimization framework, we have these objective functions and we need to decide where to, what to explore next. So which intervention to perform next. And we do that with what we call the causal expected improvement. So remember that in this case, we don't only need to explore different parts of the input space, but also need different functions. So for each function, we can define an expected improvement, which consider what is the current best, this y of s, and is computing what is the expected improvement for that specific intervention and for different values, for different x. And in this case, we standardize also for, we normalize for the, uh, for the cost in such a way that we are uh, exploiting those interventions that will, act, will lead us to a higher expected improvement, but also accounting for their cost. Um, so the idea is that we're going to select the next uh, intervention by selecting the expected improvement that is higher across the different, the highest across the different interventions. On top of that, there's another element that we need to consider. At every step, we need to decide not only if we uh, on which set we want to intervene, but also if we intervene. Indeed, on the one hand, we can decide to observe the system a bit more, collect observational data, update the prior. Uh, on the other hand, we might decide to intervene and then collect interventional data. So how are we gonna do that? So we do that with an epsilon greening criteria. Um, and the epsilon is proportional to how much of the interventional range is, is covered by the observational data. So how much data I have, but also how much I can cover by just sampling from the model, from the system. Uh, so um, the intuition is that if I have, uh, if my observational data are gonna cover very well the, the interventional domain that I'm interested in exploring, then I don't need to uh, spend money and perform intervention because I can recover pretty well what the causal effect will be just by do computations. If instead the part of the interventional domain that is covered by the, inter the observational data is very small, like in this case, it's only this specific region, which is the convex hole of the observational domain, then I need to intervene and get interventional data in order to find out what happens, for instance, in this region. So that's what this epsilon criteria is, is, is actually uh, doing. Now, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so before you move ahead, I think there are a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, um, people are asking about the uh, clarification of the, of the cost. Uh, if you have yeah. different costs for different nodes, and also um, how does it happen that the expected improvement is divided by the cost of, of intervention? So I think if you could clarify that. I think that would be yeah, so, so the cost structure, uh, so in this case, I'm just giving you a, a, for, a, a function, so a very general formulation. So I'm assuming, for instance, uh, um, I can have a, a cost that depends on the variable. So if I intervene on soil fumigants, I'm going to 
incur a cost that is different from intervening on L1 population, for instance. But it's also, um, I'm making it also dependent on the value. So if I set the soil fumigants to one, I might pay a price that is different from setting the soil fumigants to 10. But um, so what I'm measuring here is the expected in, uh, improvement per unit of cost. Um, and um, you can make this cost function very flexible. It depends on the specific application. Um, and potentially you might also learn it if you're, if you're interested in doing that. Is this answering the question? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, so to summarize the algorithm before we move forward. Um, so it's very simple. It's basically uh, three steps. First step, so again, we have some observational data, we have some interventional data. We might have it at the beginning or not. The framework is flexible. You can incorporate whatever, you know, not, um, we can, you can incorporate interventional data if you have them. Um, so at every step in the Bayesian optimization, we decide whether to observe or to intervene. If we observe, we update our prior distribution. So we update the prior distribution for all of the model um, that we are keeping because of the different interventions that we want to evaluate. If instead we intervene, we decide where to intervene based on the expected improvement. So based on a comparison of the different expected improvement for each function, um, we collect the interventional data and then we update our GP model, uh, that is the GP model associated to the intervention that we decided to to perform and this is really important because at every time that you perform an intervention you're only going to update the gp uh, the the surrogate model for the intervention the specific intervention that you've performed so let's look at some results so that i can then introduce and and tell you what the limitations of these are um, so we consider the causal graph on the left that is the one that i showed you before here a and c are not manipulative we can only observe them we have a target, this is why, and we have some unobserved confounder for A and B. So we run the algorithm and we compare the CBO algorithm together with the standard Bayesian optimization algorithm. Uh, we use both a standard prior, so RBF kernel and zero mean, and this prior construction um, that I mentioned before that inc incorporates the observational data. And the first thing to notice is that the Bayesian optimization, which is represented by these two lines, converges to this orange line so this orange value, while the CBO algorithm converges to this red value. So they don't converge to do, to, they converge to do different solutions and the Bayesian optimization one is suboptimal because in this case, we are trying to minimize the Y. And this is because you remember before I was showing you the causal graph uh, for a global optimization problem in which we were uh, optimizing all of, the, all of the nodes. In that case, we are breaking the causal relationship between variables. So we are blocking this propagation of causal effects that is not uh, happening in the Bayesian optimization framework. So in this case, if I intervene on all of the variables, I block, for instance, the propagation of causal effect from B, C, D, and Y. So I'm not able to achieve this specific value by intervening on all variables. Um, this is... Uh, this is not happening in CBO because in CBO we are exploring this possibility, but we are not selecting it as optimal. Um, the other thing to notice is that when we use this prior GP construction, we converge to the optimal value, value, value faster than competing methods because we provide more information on the, um, and we construct a, a more complex surrogate model. Now, there are some limitations that you might have already noticed, but let's, let's recap for the, what we said up to now. So many real systems decompose in interconnected nodes. Um, in order to find the optimal intervention, we need to intervene and solve a causal optimization problem that can be solved using the CBO algorithm. That CBO algorithm improves the Bayesian optimization when we have causal information available that can be incorporated in a causal graph. CBO explores interventions that are worth intervening on and it merges the with, with the causal GP prior construction, observational and interventional data. So all this is very beautiful, we can do that, but the problem is what happens when you have a very big graph? Uh, how many GP do you need to have and do you, have, do you need to, cap, to keep in order to solve a, a CBO um, problem? So Virginia, uh, so we have another question in yeah. the case for Pierre. 
Um, so he says, if you allow uh, Bayesian optimization to only intervene on one node, you wouldn't have this gap in optimal solutions with causal Bayesian optimization, right? So I think what, uh, what he's saying is that uh, if you can only intervene on one node, if the result that you get with base opt and with, uh, with cost of the soft will be uh, equivalent in that case. Well, if you only have one variable uh, and if you define the objective of the Bayesian optimization to be the expected value of y given do, which is something that you don't do in Bayesian optimization, yes. Um, what was I saying? Okay, yeah. So, um, so sorry again. So, uh, um, um, so there is another question before you move to the to the to the next part. Yeah. Uh, so Chris um, is asking, how do your approach compare and contrast with Google's causal impact R framework? Uh, likewise, Bayesian and likewise designing to disambiguate designing intervention and impacts. It will be very interesting to do a side by side of the two approaches. Do you perhaps have a code available to try your approach? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the with that paper. I would be very, very interested in understanding what they do, uh, because actually when we were writing this paper, we couldn't find any other you know, similar framework that we could compare it to. Uh, there is code and it's available online on my GitHub page. And we have another question from Kerman uh, that is asking if you could use a multi-output GP instead of one GP per node. And that's a very good question because that's what I will speak about next. <laughs> that's exactly the point. That's where I'm going. Yeah, and Chris is also saying that uh, he's happy to show you because uh, he has been using the, the code, so. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so, um, so now, now it comes the connection with multitask GPs. Um, so basically, um, what I've tried to highlight also before is that the number of GPs that we need to model, that we need to keep in order to solve this problem is determined by the power set or the, the, the cardinality of the, uh, of the sets that we need to explore. So all of the possible intervention that we might need to uh, evaluate. And this can be very large um, and it, it's growing exponentially depending on, on the number of nodes that we have in the graph. This is only one of the limitation and, and, and the reason why we need to, to use multitask GP. Uh, the, other the other reason is that when we perform an intervention, let's say you perform an intervention on X, you only update the interventional GP, so the GP that you're keeping for the intervention on X, but actually performing an intervention on X and the output that you get from it could provide you with some information about the output that you can get by intervening on both X and Z. So for instance, you have intervened on soil fumigants and the Elmore population, you should be able to say something about what happens or with, a, with a certain uncertainty about uh, from an intervention that only uh, is, is only performed on soil fumigants. So let's go back to our very simple example, our starting point, we have X, Z and Y. And so these are the, the three functions that we want to explore. We want to explore intervention on X, we want to explore intervention on Z, and we might also want to explore intervention on X and Z, even though we've seen that we can get rid of that using some properties. And, and what I was telling you at the beginning is that we want to, to, to find this system configuration, but we want to find it in a very efficient way. So we need a methodology that allow us to transfer interventional information. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's first introduce a, slight, a little bit of more of notation. Um, so we were speaking about f of s before. So this f of x was the expected value of y given that we intervene on xs. And now for notational simplicity, we're going to call it t of s just because we're going to use a, a base function, so an f function. But what we want to learn is actually the complete set of functions uh, are related to all of the intervention that we have in a causal graph. We still have observational data, we still have interventional data, and, and so our, our goal is placing a prior distribution on this set of function, then computing the procedure, and then be able to predict what is going to happen when you perform an intervention that you haven't maybe uh, performed before and at a level, an intervention level that you haven't set before. Um, so how are we going to do that? So again, 
we need to study the correlation function between these functions. We don't know. So all of these functions are, are defined on different interventions. They are all in different spaces. We don't know what is the correlation among them. And generally, multitask models, they deal with functions that are of the same dimensionality or on the same input domain. So we need to find a way, a sensible way to model the correlation between these functions. We need to then define a prior distribution for these functions, and we need to develop a multitask model that allow us to compute the posterior distribution of these functions. So let's focus for a second on the first step, and I will uh, cover this very briefly because it's quite complicated. So I will just give you an intuition of what, what is happening. So the idea is that um, you can show that all of the functions that you're trying to learn, so they are connected to different interventions in a graph, can be written as an integral transformation of the same function. So this uh, red function is what we call a base function. So base function is a reference function, let's say, and it can be shown to be equal to again, a function that is computed in the graph. So you have this function that is the expected value of y, given that we intervene on the parents and we condition on the colliders, sorry, on the colliders, on the confounders uh, to y that are not colliders. So you, you look at the graph, you find the, the, the parents, you find the variables that are uh, confounded with y, and you know that this is your base function. And you know that you can write an integral transformation that maps this function to any other function in the causal graph. So that means that, oh, and obviously the, 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 the probability distribution that you use to do this integration depends on how, what is the causation structure between the base function, so the parents and the, and the confounders, and the set that you're trying to compute the function, the intervention of for. Um, so let's make a concrete example and you see that is easier than, uh, than, than set. Um, so um, let's go back to our case, x, z, and y. And we said that we wanted to learn these three functions that we call now t of x, t of z, and t of x and z. Now, what is the, the parent of y? No, in this case, we only have z. We don't have confounder, so c is the empty set. So this thing is telling us that we need to define the expected value of y given that we do the parents as base function. So this is our base function. f of z is, is equal to the expectation of y given to z. The remaining function can be obtained as an integral transformation of this fz with a specific distribution that is linking z, the parent, to the set x for which we are computing the function. That's it. Um, so all you actually need to know to do is look at the graph. For instance, here you have another example. Find the parents, e and d. Find the, the nodes, the variables that are confounded with y, so a and b. And you know that that's a function that you need to model because then you can express all of the function has a transformation of that one. And this is actually what we do. We just say, OK, if all of the function can be represented as a transformation of f, we can place a prior on f and then propagate this prior through the integral transform. Using GPs, you can place a GP prior on the base function. And you can actually use the same prior construction that we saw uh, working very well for the CBO case. So we can integrate observational data in our base function, propagate this base function through the integral operator, and get the GP distribution for all of the function in the causal graph. So we don't have to keep different models. We don't have to worry about defining a consistent prior for the maybe thousand functions that we have in a causal graph, all we need to do is place a GP prior on this specific function and then propagate it. We also assume a likelihood function, which is Gaussian, uh, and, and we get a joint posterior distribution with standard GP updates. So overall, what is the idea? Well, the idea is that if you have observational data, you have interventional data and you have some conditions in the causal graph that are then given in the theorem that I'm not specifying here, you can construct what we call a DAC GP model. So this multitask GP formulation that allows you to integrate observational data, interventional data, and to exchange information across different experiments so that you can learn about this potential outcome that you can get from the graph in a much more efficient way. So let's look at the graph as we did before. Uh, this is the same graph that we saw for CBO, same function. This is the, the dual of uh, y given, expedition of y given dual of x. This is the black line. And we have some interventional points that are these red dots. 
we have some observational points that are these uh, um, black crosses. And so let's focus on the left plot. Uh, you can see in blue what you would get by a single task model. So the predictive mean and variance with a single task model, the one that we were using in CBO. And in green, what you would get by um, multitask model. And the first thing to see is that using a, a multitask model, you're able to recover parts of the, the, the behavior of the true intervention function in areas where you don't observe data. And also very interestingly, you can also decrease the uncertainty in this part, which is something that is very important if you wanna use this model for uh, active learning or Bayesian optimization. If on top of that, you use a multitask and you incorporate the observational information through the prior that we suggested, not only you can capture the behavior in this part of the space, but also here. So between minus two and zero. So uh, using a DAGGP model with a causal prior allows you to recover almost exactly the true, intent, the true um, intervention function in all of these parts of the space, minus two and two, where you have observational data and interventional data. Obviously, you're still uncertain in these parts of the space. So before minus two and after two, because you don't have any information there. Right, so... So Virginia, one uh, one question from 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 Eduardo before you move. Uh, yeah. Into the uh, so Eduardo is asking, which is the complexity of this algorithm, and also are the integrals tractable or need to be approximated? And if they are infeasible, how do you approximate them? So uh, so in this in our code we did it with Monte Carlo uh, Monte Carlo estimation of these integrals. There are specific cases when you use a, a RBF kernel and you use um, uh, Gaussians to approximate this distribution for which this is tractable, but this only holds when you have standard GP distributions, uh, sorry, standard GP, um, sorry, RBF kernel for this K and you don't use the, the causal construction that we are proposing. So if you wanna use fully and integrate fully the data, you need to approximate these integrals. And uh, Chris is also asking, is uh, further elaborating on the on the code about the about the algorithm. But I think we can we can think up offline about about that. Okay. Um, ah, the complexity. The complexity is determined by the number of points that you have for each intervention. So it's the union is uh, is of order cubic where. The, let's say n is given by the sum of the interventional points that you have over the different interventions. Okay, so well, I just have like a couple of slides more. Um, so, so you can use these algorithms in different settings. You can use it for just learning the intervention function. You can use it within active learning and all of these results are showing you the paper. Here, I'm just showing you what happens when you use this model for a, Bayesian, a causal Bayesian optimization uh, in the causal Bayesian optimization model that we talked about before. Um, so this DAG1 is the XZ1 case that we were looking at. And this DAG2 is given, it's, it's basically, um, what is it? This this second graph. So this is the first graph, and the, this is the first DAG, and this is the second DAG. Sorry about that. Um, so in in green, you can see the results, um, the convergence of the algorithm to the true optimum. This black this black line, um, when when using the DAG GP model with prior with the causal GP prior, while the green dashed line. Uh, represents the convergence of the algorithm when using the lag GP, but without the causal, with the standard, with the standard prior. So, and, and the, here the same. So you can see that overall the DAG GP model with causal prior converges to the optimal value faster than any competing methods. I'll conclude with it with a real example. So we also tried to run CBO and this version of, of CBO with the multitask model for a real data example. So uh, this is one of the examples that I showed you at the beginning, uh, where we are trying to minimize the level of PSA by acting on starting and aspirin. And you can see how basically, again, the DAGGP model converges to the um, to the, to the true um, optimal value faster than when using a, a, a single task model. And so it, it's basically here we assume a cost, uh, a unique cost for each intervention. So after five values, up to five interventional values, we are able to say what is the optimal intervention to perform. 
So decoal messages, uh, so the DACGP model allows to efficiently learn decosal effects in a graph and identify efficiently the optimal intervention to perform. It captures the non-trivial correlation of these different functions that are defined on different experimental outputs. And it enables property uncer proper uncertainty quantification, which can be used within decision-making algorithm to choose experiments to perform. And I'd like to conclude um, thanking my amazing collaborators, Javier, Theo, Mauricio, Xia Yu, and Andre. And these are the two papers that I spoke about today. Thank you. Amazing. Um, thanks, uh, Virginia. So we have uh, another question from Chris. Um, so maybe this has been mentioning, but uh, what size in terms of the number of nodes DAX have you been able to use efficiently in the experiments that you have? So, so the biggest, uh, the biggest graph for which we run this was the let me go back the environment uh, uh, ecology example. Well, this one in which we had like. Um, a lot of, of experiments to explore, but that's the that's the the, the biggest one that we explored. Yeah. Um, so we have another question for Pierre. Um, he's asking, do you have a way to deal with the uncertainty over the structure of the graph? Not yet. Um, um, no, we assume it to be known, but if you think about uh, the Bayesian optimization framework, but even like in the second model, you can think about um, defining an acquisition function that explores the, um, the intervention that are allowing you to uh, identify uh, the causal model, so identify the causal structure. But this is something that is still not there. So let me see, we have a few more questions. So Herman is also asking, have you tried to use the GPLVM as a super uh, semi-supervised artifact to discover the causal DAC in, in that way, you may have latent variables. No, we didn't, but it's actually a very cool idea. Actually, no, we didn't try it. Um, another question from Suyo is, uh, what kind of behavior would you expect mm -hmm. uh, if the initial causal model is misspecified? Uh, would the right model be eventually learned after many interventions? If the causal graph, meaning, Mm, no, <laughs> I don't think so, no. because you're, um, if the, if the causal, so if the causal, um, if the causal graph is not known, um, you might need to, so you, so you're computing wrongly the, the, the prior. So the prior is, is like, you cannot use the prior formulation um but you also might need to explore different sets like all of your uh, all of your assumptions are falling apart um and we have uh, another question from rodrigo who is uh, saying is the publication uh, multitask also learning with calcium process public uh, i cannot find it online <laughs> no but it will be next week <laughs> We'll soon be on archive. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, so I don't think we have any any further questions. Um, so we can wrap up here. So thank you very much, Virginia, Thanks, for the you. for the for the for the talk. I think that, I think that was great. Um, so we have uh, now. Uh, so we have uh, you have closed the workshop and the and the summer school. This was the this was the last. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but not the but not the last uh, event of the of the summer school. We still have a uh, discussion that will start at three. Um, so if you have more questions about the uh, causal inference, uh, you will be able to share those with the with the speakers. Uh, we will start the discussion at three. So you are, are welcome, and and we see you there. So let's take a small break. Um, see you there for the discussion and for the final wrap up of the. Just to emphasize that we only have uh, 11 minutes because we start at three. Yeah, this is a very short break. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. yeah. it's yeah. not it's, it's not a half an hour break. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs>